evening. In my role as interim dean uh, of the Ross School of Business and also interim chair of the William Davidson Institute's board, I am delighted to welcome all of you to the WDI or William Davidson Institute's Ralph Gerson Distinguished Lecture tonight. The relationship between the William Davidson Institute and the Ross School of Business has been a very positive and important one for both entities, I would say, since the day that the Institute was created. And this distinguished lecture, which we are hosting together, uh, is but one of the examples of the many ways in which we collaborate. I am happy to now turn things over to Professor Paul Clyde, who is the president of the William Davidson Institute, as well as the Tom Lantus Professor of Business Administration here at the Ross School of Business, who will introduce our speaker, Professor Clyde. Thank you, Francine. And thanks to all of you for joining us for the Ralph J. Gerson Distinguished Lecture. Um, this lecture was established at the 25th anniversary celebration of the William Davidson Institute to honor founding and current board member, Ralph J. Gerson. Ralph has played a central role in the Institute since it was established in 1992. Ralph's career spans the public and private sector, including board chair and other executive positions in Guardian Industries. And he currently serves on numerous boards in the United States and Israel. We are grateful for his continued engagement and the guidance he provides in ensuring that the Institute continues to pursue its mission as laid out by Bill Davidson at the William Davidson Institute's founding which is to equip economic decision makers in emerging countries with the tools of commercial success. Today, we are honored to have Kevin Lobo, CEO and Chair of Stryker, speaking on challenges and opportunities for healthcare companies operating in low and middle income countries. These countries present enormous opportunities, arguably the most significant opportunities in the coming decade. Within healthcare, healthcare expenditures have increased three times faster in low and middle income countries compared to high income countries since 2000. The results of this increase in investments have been impressive. Deaths due to vaccine-related diseases have dropped by 60, 70, even 90% in some cases. And while deaths due to tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV AIDS continue, they are no longer among the top 10 causes of death world worldwide. Thus, the increase in the prevalence of other diseases, such as chronic diseases, is in a sense good news. People are living longer now in low and middle income countries, and as a result, Diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and stroke are increasingly the cause of mortality and morbidity. Surgical procedures are also taking on more importance. These shifts create challenges that differ from those being addressed in 2000 and require different business models. The ability of global health companies to serve these markets may require setting up support systems that do not currently exist. However, companies that develop a profitable way to address these diseases will be able to tap into the fastest growing markets and echoing Bill Davidson, in doing so, they will drive economic growth and social freedom in those countries. And the implications are likely to extend beyond low and middle income countries. Companies may also be able to use this knowledge to improve operations in their high income markets. If they don't, they may find they are losing market share to those who do. Kevin will be speaking to this from the perspective of Stryker, a leading medical technology company founded in Kalamazoo, Michigan, by an orthopedic surgeon and an inventor 80 years ago. Today, the company works to improve patient and hospital outcomes in areas such as robotics, data and enabling technologies, advanced imaging, and stroke care solutions. Stryker is a Fortune 500 company with 43,000 employees worldwide and has received numerous accolades, including as one of Fortune's world's best workplaces. Kevin was appointed CEO of Stryker in 2012 and chair in 2014 and has received numerous awards himself, including being named Executive of the Year by MedTech Dive and one of America's most innovative leaders by Forbes in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Lobo. Kevin? Well, thank you, Paul. First of all, thank you for inviting me to, to share the Stryker story and, and our experiences uh, in the emerging markets, uh, as well as to give you an overview of the overall company. I'm, I'm delighted to be with everyone and I have a short presentation, which I'll run through fairly quickly, and then really uh, looking forward to having time to have question and answer. So if you could please advance the slide. 
We'll start off with our mission and values. And, and this we launched about eight years ago at our company. And you can see it's very simple. Uh, our mission is together with our customers, we are driven to make healthcare better. And then we have our four values on the bottom. And, and this is the, the, the uniform rallying cry of our entire company, our 44,000 employees. Uh, we have different divisions. We're very decentralized. We have uh, all these businesses from implants to hospital beds, to stretchers, to cameras. And, but everybody has the same mission and the same values, even though each division has maybe slightly different personalities. And, and this is true everywhere in the world. So every presentation that we do starts off with the, the mission and values. Let's go to the next slide. So this company, Stryker, is actually was founded by an orthopedic surgeon in Kalamazoo, Michigan, Dr. Homer Stryker, uh, 80 years ago. So we are now 80 years old, and his granddaughter, Rhonda Stryker, serves on our board. So we take that name very personally. Uh, obviously, for Rhonda, it's personal. That, that is her name. But being founded by a surgeon uh, is pretty incredible uh, that the company has grown to be a Fortune 500 company from a very humble roots um, in Western Michigan. Let's go to the next slide. So here's just at a glance, you can see some numbers here. We're actually gonna do about 17 billion in revenue this year. Last year, of course, was affected by the pandemic. So our, our sales actually went backwards for the first time since the company went public in 1979, but large company, we had 40 years of straight growth until uh, the pandemic year of last year. And uh, you can see we spend a lot of money in R&D. So we spend almost a billion dollars a year in research and development. And, and that is a big source of our innovation is internal innovation. And later on, I'll talk to you more about uh, acquisition. Let's go to the next one. Uh, here are just a number of recognitions. So we do have a, what we believe is a very special culture. And uh, part of that culture is how we hire people. And we're very team oriented, very mission driven. And over the years, we've uh, added to our being a great place to work in, in the United States with many regional awards as a great place to work in many countries around the world. That is something I'm quite proud of because we were, when I joined 10 years ago, quite American in our outlook. We still have a lot of our sales in the United States, but we have grown uh, very well internationally, now, primarily in the developed countries, but, but increasingly, we're starting to get very good growth out of the emerging markets. And, and I'm also very pleased to to show awards for diversity, uh, being a great place to work for women, um, as well as minorities and under, other underrepresented classes. Um, next slide, please. Here is our company strategy, just on one page. And the first statement is actually our statement of strategy, is to drive market-leading growth and be category leaders in our three segments of med surge, orthopedics, and neurotechnology and spine. And you can see in the third pillar, globalization is one of those, which is, of course, uh, the theme of this uh, talk today, talking about emerging markets. And, and for Stryker, it's a gigantic opportunity. Uh, we really have um, a small percentage of sales in emerging markets, which I'll, I'll talk about a little later. But we really have been a very intimately customer-focused organization, which has been an engine of growth for us. Tremendous innovation, both internally developed as well as through acquisitions. And we deliver top tier financial performance um, really ahead of our peers. And we trade at a premium. Our, our stock price trades at a premium versus other companies uh, in our market. We're known for having top tier quality and for having a very unique, uh, very driven culture. Next slide, please. So here's just a sampling of the acquisitions that we've done uh, over the past uh, eight years. We've done a roughly 50 acquisitions since I've been CEO. Many are small single product acquisitions, but you can see are some of the larger acquisitions. And if you look at the slide, most of the acquisitions are, in, are colored in blue, which means they fit into our existing businesses and just augment the existing portfolio that we have really to the same surgeon or to the same healthcare professional. You can see there's a few that are in a kind of a purple color so those are entering into new markets. And uh, very interestingly, the very first one in purple, you see there in the beginning of 2013 is Trossen. Uh, that was my very first acquisition and that was low priced trauma and spine implants uh, in China. So the very first deal that I did was uh, the first deal Stryker had ever done, uh, primarily for the emerging markets and addressing lower priced products. So going into low middle income uh, countries. And we've since 
exported those products to, to other countries in the world. Very uh, curiously, the next deal is listed there as Mako in, in the same year, 2013, my, my first full year as CEO. And that was the complete opposite. That's robotic assisted surgery for hip and knee replacement. Uh, absolutely premium priced, high innovation. And so uh, really covered both spectrums in my very first year as CEO. And then you can see that after that, a steady, steady stream of acquisitions. And, and we just look at acquisitions as another way of innovating. So we innovate internally and we innovate externally. Okay, next slide, please. So emerging markets, uh, they represent a big, big opportunity. You can see here on the slide that only 6% of our sales today are in what we call emerging markets. And, and I include China as part of the emerging markets, as do all of my peer companies. The average in the medical technology industry is closer to 12%. So we lag quite a bit. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. And I would say the, the first is that Stryker operates in, in high acuity, acute um, intervention procedures such as hip and knee replacement, neurovascular products. Uh, and so our products require a high level of service. They're very high tech. And if you look at an, a company like Becton Dickinson as an example, which is a, a terrific med tech company, their sales are about 20% in emerging markets, but they, they sell syringes. They sell what I would call more diagnostic tests. So, so I would call more basic procedures that are less service intensive. And so they have a much higher percentage of sales. So that's one reason is the nature of our portfolio. The second reason is that we acquire so many companies. You saw on the previous slide that we're a, a very active acquirer of companies. And the, choir, the companies we acquire tend to have a lot of US revenue or mature market revenue. And so that drives up the percentage, just simple math, of driving up the percentage that we have in the United States if the companies we acquire have not yet penetrated in the emerging market. So those are the two reasons why we do lag the med tech average, but I, I really have a goal to increase that 6% and to get closer to the average over the next five years. I was very excited before the pandemic in 2019, we grew 20% in emerging markets. Stryker's overall growth rate was about 8%. So you can see much faster growth in emerging markets. And I expect once this pandemic sort of subsides, that we'll get back to growing two or three times faster in emerging markets than we grow in the, in the developed markets. Within the emerging markets, it's mostly premium products that we're selling. So basically the same kind of products to hospitals that look quite similar. As you know, there are very advanced hospitals in, in most countries in the world. And, and that's where the bulk of our emerging market sales are, as, except for the troughs and acquisition, which uh, I mentioned earlier on. Clearly, Paul already talked about demographics. They are favoring emerging markets over the long term. And for Stryker, we've decided that the priority markets for us within emerging markets, this doesn't mean they're exclusive, right? We're going to sell in many more countries than these, but the ones where we're really putting extra emphasis are China, Brazil, India, Turkey, and Russia, where we already have a foothold. We have strong leadership in place, and we have a tremendous scope to grow both in the premium segment of those countries, but also in what we call mid-tier or lower priced products. Let's go to the next slide, please. There's a lot of challenges in emerging markets. And so there, every CEO that I've spoken to uh, in med tech and even outside of med tech would say that uh, it's not for the faint of heart, the emerging markets. And uh, everybody has scars from uh, their progress or if you have a big business, it, it didn't go up in a straight line like it does in some other countries. Uh, you have stops and starts. Uh, for Stryker, really, we haven't had a, as many investments made historically. We've been a little gun shy, honestly, to, to go after emerging markets with vigor. Part of the reason for our hesitancy has been the high service intensive nature of our products. Uh, we've had compliance challenges. So if you sell very high priced products and you have to go through distribution channel to get those products to the end hospital, the corruption occurs and uh, we've been, you know, we've had FCPA issues in the past in certain small market countries. And so that's caused us to retrench and, and to be very hesitant as we enter into some of these markets. Uh, and then the government can be very unpredictable. Uh, we saw most recently um, in India, we had uh, overnight a price reduction of 75% on knee implants in the market. And uh, so unpredictability is a real challenge. 
the fact that some markets are are lower priced, that's okay. We can operate in a market that's lower priced if it's predictable. If the regulatory, the payment, and the procurement processes are fairly predictable, then you can build a business over a decade or two decades. And, and so sometimes you have these unpredictable government policies that can really take your business sideways and they can do it, frankly, overnight. So those are some of the challenges. And, and those challenges, by the way, aren't going to go away. Uh, we just have to get better at learning how to manage uh, these challenges. And in the case of India in particular, we're actually engaging with the government and having very productive discussions for what I believe will be a terrific uh, trade deal, a trade agreement between the US and India that'll bring much more stability and predictability to their practices. And, and that'll be really important for future growth in that country. Next slide, please. So the opportunity in low price, I already mentioned Tross in my very first acquisition. I would tell you uh, the results were mixed. So just like everybody else that enters emerging markets, you uh, you get a few scars. Uh, we we had some ups and downs. Uh, frankly, uh, most of the, the challenges we had were self-inflicted. So we had some leadership issues. We, uh, we we really didn't adapt as quickly as we could have to the to the local market. But I'm very excited to have the asset inside of Stryker and the future is uh, is very bright. We've we've always been able to make good money. So the, some of the misnomers are, well, if the prices are lower, you can't make money. And to our surprise, we actually make as good margins with Trossen in China as we do with the premium products in China. Now, the factory that we make the products, it's in Changzhou. It's in a very low uh, low sort of cost area of China. It's not FDA approved, so it doesn't go through the same regulatory standards that the FDA requires, but that enables us to sell it at a lower price, and which is required in the tier three hospitals um, in China. So we're pretty excited about having the portfolio. We have fixed some of our own, um, let's call them management challenges. Uh, we've launched new products and, uh, and we've even exported some of these products to India, to Turkey, to Brazil, because of the public sector of Brazil, the pricing is quite a bit lower than the private sector of Brazil. And so uh, we're getting better at, at, at uh, commercializing the Trossen brand. Uh, the brand is a strong brand, certainly within China. Uh, but we've now decided, we've just appointed, frankly, just in the last month, a new president for China that looks after both the Trossen business and the premium business. So up to this year, we had kept the two businesses completely separate, completely separate management, completely separate brand. And what we're realizing is the way the government's buying products in China is they're now merging these. They used to have separate buying patterns, but now they're, they're actually merging the two. And so you'll have a surgeon that will use in the morning a high-priced product, let's say a knee replacement product from Stryker, and then in the afternoon, they'll use a Trossen product, uh, which is very, very low-priced because a lot of times the patients are paying for the products, and if they can't afford the higher-priced product, they'll use the lower price. So... The market's getting more integrated, just like it is in India. That's a change in China. We're adapting to that by putting in one leader and sort of combining some parts of the businesses around government procurement, uh, government access, and so dealing with the governments. Uh, we used to do that as two separate organizations. We're going to start to merge those together uh, as one organization. Okay, next slide, please. And growth is very possible in emerging markets. It just requires uh, the, the commitment and the, the ability to sustain investments over time. Uh, like I say, Stryker historically has not made those big heavy investments, but I would say that uh, we're now prepared to do so. On my last uh, earnings call, people, I had a question about China. And so very publicly, I said that we're actually looking to invest in China. This is at a time when many of our competitors are pulling back from China because of the volume-based procurement, uh, government purchasing practices, but we have such a small presence for us, we're going to lean in a little bit um, in China and in emerging markets in general. Uh, we think for us, it's it's a good time to start moving forward, uh, especially when our com competitors are starting to pull back a little bit. The key is to prioritize the opportunities and to really make sure that you understand the regulatory hurdles. It, to launch a product in China for Stryker, it usually arrives three years after it's been launched in the United States or in Europe just getting through the, the China FDA. And so part of that challenge is your R&D engineers need to stay with the product. If they move on to the next product and they're not there when you launch in China, that they don't have the support they need to be successful in the marketplace. 
And then obviously you have to make sure that the products address clinical uh, and economic needs of the country. And so you have to have this mindset that uh, good enough products are what's required sometimes because they just can't afford the higher price products. That's a mindset that's been challenging, honestly, for our company to, to say we're willing to accept something that's not the best uh, because it's what's needed in the marketplace because the alternative is that the patient doesn't get care. And, and that's not an alternative that makes us feel responsible um, as, as leaders in, in the markets where we operate. Let's keep going. I think that, that might be my last slide, is it? Yes, that's my last slide. So I want to thank all of you for, for tuning in. And, uh, and then I'll turn it open over to you, Paul, for a Q&A. Great. Thank you. Um, and we do have some questions. Let me start by asking you a little bit more about um, your discussion about the markets that you are in. So you mentioned China, Russia, India, Turkey, and Brazil. Right. Um, and you mentioned that you already had a presence in them. Can you say more about what it is about those markets in particular? Is it just populations and GDP per capita, or is there something else that you're looking for? And I'm, I'm talking about internal growth now, not, not acquisitions. Yes, I would say you, you hit on the right things. I mean, these are big markets where uh, they do have a premium segment, and they also have an additionally uh, a lower price segment. But they're big markets where healthcare innovation is rewarded and they have surgeons, they have a network already established. Our products are, are quite complex. So if you, a place like Indonesia, for example, it's still emerging. And so first you have to get a good consumer market. Then you have to build the basic diagnostics and basic procedures. Then they have to build more complex hospitals that can do acute care procedures. So Indonesia is further down the line. I know it's a, it has great demographics. It's big, it's growing, but honestly for us, it's not a priority. Uh, because it's not yet ready, it doesn't have the infrastructure in place to really support the complex technologies that Stryker has. The ones I cited to you, the priority markets, again, they're not the only countries we sell in. We have a good business in Chile and Colombia, Mexico, but those are the ones where we see the biggest opportunity. Part of it is the demographics. Part of it is our presence, our size relative to the opportunity. Within our markets, we have significant opportunity in those countries for growth. So, so it's because of specific products you're offering. I wondered how much, you mentioned something also about your presence and it sounded like you were talking about your personnel capabilities in those countries. Yeah, that's one of the things we found. Honestly, uh, we had to hire people for the size of business we aspire to be in. So historically we would hire, let's say the business was $30 million and you would recruit and you go to the recruiters and you say, well, we're, we have a $30 million business. They would hire somebody that, could manage a $30 million business. But in these markets, you can be growing 20, 30%, 40% a year. So before long, that $30 million business is a $100 million business. And well, is that leader capable of scaling to that $100 million? Our experience has been not really. And so we stubbed our toe with, we have to hire somebody that's already running a $100 million business, but we have to convince them to start with a $30 million business and grow with us. And so I, I had to personally get involved in hiring a leader in one of these countries myself to convince them to join Stryker because as you know, our brand is very strong in, in North America. You saw all those awards we win. But in some of these countries, in Turkey, for example, Stryker brand is not a strong brand, not as well known. And so we, that was part of our, our learnings is we, we had to bring in much more sophisticated talent uh, who are used to dealing with this complex distribution channels and complex regulatory systems. And in those countries, we have fantastic leaders. It took us time, but we've really have the right leadership in place. And then they've hired, brought in the, the right people underneath them. So now we're poised to grow. So I held off making big investments in some of these countries, because if you make in big investments and you don't have the right leadership, it's kind of like lighting your money on fire. That was been our experience. We, we haven't done well. But now we're really well positioned in those markets to make investments and to see a return on those investments. Has that increased your ability to enter other markets then because you now have the experience of hiring and training people for those kinds of growth rates? Yeah, well, I would say, Paul, let me just back up for a second. So as we were strengthening these markets, and I, like I say, not just these five countries, we also have some other ones. We also withdrew from about almost 20 countries. 
uh, like Libya and certain countries where we were so small, we had no presence. And because of the complexity of our products, we would have all this inventory sitting in these countries and service that needs to be delivered that couldn't be delivered, sometimes corruption that would exist. And so part, so we, we, we bolstered certain countries, withdrew from other countries. And now as we go into new markets or scale in new markets, we have a formula to win. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is yes, we're now figuring out the formula to win. Like I say, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, these are markets that before were not so exciting for Stryker. I'm now feeling a lot better about them given the progress we've made in these other countries. So we're, we're starting to be able to have a formula that we can replicate country after country after country, but it's taken time. And let me let me ask this from the acquisition perspective. Is this um, I'm assuming this is mostly sales of products that are existing parts of the striker portfolio as opposed to going to those countries and looking for acquisitions. Is that right? Correct. So far, uh, I would say so far it's been the acquisitions we've done have been primarily for the premium segment of mm -hmm. the business. Uh, we have not. We did the one acquisition in, in China, yeah. Trossen. We did a, an acquisition in Turkey of a bed company in Kayseri, Turkey, uh, called Muka, which is low price bed. And that's been very successful in Eastern Europe, uh, in Brazil. We've sold some of those beds in India, but India is a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we had a first couple of good years and then it's been a little quieter since then. But, uh, but we are starting now, we have a business development team that's starting to look in some of these other countries for innovation, particularly South America. We think that they're, if for us to grow in South America, we're probably gonna have to do some acquisitions there in, in the in the med surge side of the business, and so I do imagine that we will do more deals in the future in these countries. Great. Um, we have a question here from uh, from Ralph. Actually, when you go into your priority markets with your products, do you take special steps to protect your intellectual property? Do you rely on negotiations rather than the legal system to solve IP issues? Yeah, you know, IP has not been a problem for us. Because to be honest, most of our products, the trade secret is more important than intellectual property. So kind of unlike pharmaceuticals, uh, we our power tools that we make, they could look at it all they want. Being able to reproduce that is virtually impossible. We don't have IP. We have trade secret of mm -hmm. knowing how to seal those power tools so that they can survive in the autoclave. And so the trade secret in med tech is kind of more important than intellectual property for most of our portfolio. In the area of robotics, that's the one where we sort of are a little bit nervous about, uh, but we've now launched in China, we've launched in Brazil, and we just know that we have such a head start in that world that, yes, they can try to copy it, but it's it's going to be very difficult. And we may not be able to enforce our intellectual property, but we're all not that worried about it. It's a bit of a kind of an arms race. If you get all your robots placed and they start using those robots, the chance of them converting, it'll take it a decade at least or more before we start to lose business and it's not worth waiting. So for us in med tech, for the striker portfolio, uh, you know, you hear a lot uh, politically, you hear about IP and IP theft, and I'm sure that's real in the tech world. Uh, it's not really a big factor for med tech. Our barriers are much more around compliance, around, you know, the government pricing, purchasing uh, patterns, training of the surgeons and making sure we have a network and infrastructure, be able to train them and service the, their business. That's a, those are bigger barriers for us, not really intellectual property. Okay. Let me ask a little, uh, some specific questions about regions. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is moving toward a, a free trade zone. They signed, officially moved there in January of this year. Um, steps are being taken to make, to see where what direction that's taking. That would result in a, a uh, population of about 1.3 billion people in an economy that's roughly the size of France's. Does that, is that on your radar? Is that still, is, is it still, um, are, are some of these other challenges you mentioned still too big for that to come up right now? Yeah, I would say for Stryker, that, that would be, those challenges would be too big. I would say that would be interesting, but we probably have to wait almost a decade. And so you, you have to do what I was describing, the Indonesia sort of model where I'm tracking Indonesia. Indonesia will come online probably five years from now. And, and yet in consumer products, it's been interesting for the last seven, eight years. If you ask Nike or if you ask uh, Pepsi or Coke and Indonesia is an interesting market for them. It hasn't, it's not yet for Stryker, maybe five years from now. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
probably might take closer to a decade. Now, that's not for all of our portfolio. That's really for the implants, the hip knee procedures, neurotechnology procedures, high complexity procedures. Uh, it'll take longer. Now, okay. some of our med search products, it's possible as we start, we're starting to experiment with lower price products, lower price power tools, lower price cameras, lower priced. If we can find solutions, those, those are the types of products that maybe could get to the sub-Saharan Africa sooner. But I would say it's we we want to wait to see the the infrastructure, the hospital build out. Uh, you need an ecosystem that's in in good shape before Stryker would enter, just given the nature of our portfolio. Okay, um, let me follow up a little bit on that. You mentioned five years for Indonesia. Is that because I, I, I'm struck by the fact that that's a, a somewhat precise estimate? Well, Is yeah. it be, because of the the um, training that that you're seeing and and the in terms of using implants or what is it that is there something you're seeing that makes you think five years well so we've started to distribute use a distributor and we're starting to let's say we we're, we i would say we're not we we sell a little bit in indonesia through a distributor one distributor and the hospital build out is occurring in Indi indonesia and the diagnostic testing is happening and the basic and basic medical procedures are happening right now. The basic ones are happening in Indonesia. Corruption is starting to improve in Indonesia. And so those are the things I we look, we watch. And five years, maybe I, I sounded more certain than I probably really am, <laughs> but it's let's say roughly five years. Uh, I, I'm not I was about to buy precise. options. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that precise, but but I I we could see you can sort of see the trend. We've seen this pattern, right? It's just pattern recognition. Yeah, yeah. The patterns are, are all shaping up right now to where Indonesia is, is tracking in a positive direction. And as we enter, though, we're going to be very careful because we've had to we've entered markets and we've had to exit them because of compliance challenges and so uh, corruption challenges, um, government purchasing uh, unpredictability, things like that. So but it's looking like it's, it's going to be a, a good market for us. But I think Sub-Saharan Africa is a longer way out. Okay. And let me return to India too. You've talked about it a couple of times in a couple of different contexts. Um, aging populations, it's growing significantly in the United States, but it's it's through the roof in India, um, the rate at which it's growing. A lot of your products, it seems like that's going to be inviting for them. How, how much does that play in your thinking about uh, about which products and, and the pace at which you're, um, and what you're willing to put up with in, in India? Yeah, well, India is not easy, right? I, I can tell you, I was born in India, so it's, it is a little personal for me. I, I grew up in, in Canada, but I was born in India, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous country, but it's not an easy country. Uh, the infrastructure is challenging, the, the distribution channel, the, the access to hospitals, there are all kinds of uh, challenges to overcome, but there are beautiful hospitals. There, there, there are uh, people who want to pay for the best technology, we are our Mako robot, for example, we now have about seven of them in India and the surgeons wanna use the products. And so there is demand for our premium price products. There's also a huge population that also needs lower price products. As I mentioned, the Trosson products were bringing those to India. We were selling our Muka bed and we were having some success um, earlier on just pre pandemic. And so, but there are other businesses like our booms and lights business that they just don't wanna pay for our quality mm -hmm. products and so we're just making no money with our beautiful but if you, but if you see some of those things seem like they would have been changed i mean as you said the the economy there has been growing at a unusual pace and and the opportunities that, i mean just what i've seen in india over the past 10 or 15 20 years there's been enormous changes on the, the healthcare side yes the the pace the trajectory seems like one that would be favorable to you correct that's why, I mean, India is on that list, right? Those list yeah, of countries, yeah, yeah. priority countries, India is on the list. I just telling you, it's not an easy country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, right. and it sounds great. You look at the numbers and, and yes, we have some of our, our, our stroke business is doing spectacularly well in India. So this is endovascular treatment to remove clots in your brain or to pack an aneurysm. That business is doing very well, but it was floundering until about four or five years ago. And we, we hired the right people and we, figured out the, the network of how to get these products to the surgeons and how to train the surgeons. And that business is just exploding in India right now. I'm so pleased. And so we're trying to use their model to help. And, but that model doesn't require 
as much service intensity. It's training. But once you know how to do those procedures, then it's it's actually, it, it's it's not as hard as doing a hip or knee replacement or a spine correction or fixing, doing a neurosurgery where you have to actually, you know, try to remove a tumor from the brain and, and you're drilling into the skull. Those, those are very complex procedures. Whereas these procedures, once you get the hang of it, you can then do them uh, much more easily. So we're starting to figure out it's not going to be all of our portfolio. And, and, and by the way, it'll be some of the most expensive products. Those are going to be great in India. It's figuring out the getting them to the hospital, having the surgeons trained. And, and so it's, a, it's, it's product by product. We're doing this evaluation and we're starting to figure out which ones are going to be successful. And so I, I believe India will be a, a great business for Stryker, but it's, it's, it's like a stormy sea, right? We'll get to this paradise, but we're, we're going to get wet. Uh, yeah. on the way to this paradise. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Salty we have a question. Waters. <laughs> we have another uh, question around, you've already mentioned some of the regulatory challenges. Um, this one is, what's the biggest challenge? What, uh, what are the biggest challenges Stryker faces with respect to uncertainty around changing government intervention, regulation, political stability, macro fiscal conditions, and what strategies do you use to mitigate impacts on revenues as you scale? in some of these uncertain emerging markets? Yeah, well, great question. I would say yes to all of those. There, every one of those comments are challenges. I would say political is probably you know, not the most important one, uh, surprisingly. It, it really is more about um, government purchasing. That's a big one, where mm -hmm. they look at some of our high price products. It doesn't apply to everything in our portfolio, but like I mentioned, India overnight decided we're going to reduce the price we're paying for for knee replacement by 75% just overnight. I mean, so you have, and, and then and you're not allowed to exit the country. Um, it's illegal. And so you had the stent makers and the knee pay, may, makers were just like, what do you mean we can't exit? No, it's illegal. You can't exit and you have to pay, you have to charge a 75% less than you're charging before. I mean, the end price to the hospital. So that's not easy to work with. And uh, so we had to do some layoffs. We, we had to retrench our business and so that's, that's the nature of India, right? So all of a sudden that happens. Now that hasn't happened often. Um, China is going through volume-based procurement. So I would say government purchasing is a, is a huge challenge. And if it can be predictable, uh, that's, that's what's important. So what do we do there? We work with USTR. And right now USTR has been a great help for us in working with India. And we now have an actual structure that's going to be I hope implemented as part of the, the current trade deal that's ongoing negotiations are happening with India and, and progressing quite well. If this trade, we call a trade margin rationalization process gets, which has been endorsed by the Minister of Health of India, if we're able to get that passed, they, that'll bring predictability. Our prices will go down, but they'll go down in a predictable manner that we can manage without that kind of abruptness. And, and that'll bring stability. So that is really important. Uh, the regulatory regime, it, it tends to be, that's a challenge everywhere in the world. That, it's not unique to the emerging markets. And China takes a little longer than it does in Japan. Japan takes longer than Europe. And, and these evolve over time, but I'm not so worried about that because those same rules apply to all my competitors. So, right. If well, it let let me ask time, you a little bit on that one, because my understanding was that a lot of your business is implants. And correct. anything that's implanted, my understanding was that you had to be able to track the patient after the implant. And so uh, I don't know if, if that's correct. My understanding, no. this was from 10 years ago. No, no, you don't have to. Basically, come, different countries have registries where they keep track of the data. I don't, I, Stryker does not have a responsibility okay. to track the patient. No, that's not a requirement for the, for the company to do. Okay. That's, not, that's not a barrier. Okay. All right. Another question came in. What are some key metrics and determinants of an emerging market that is ripe for further investment and long run opportunity? Well, certainly it's size of the market. We always look at the sort of how big is this, the current market and what's the growth rate of the market and, you know, how stable is the regulatory regime? Uh, those are very, very simple. You can do those that that math fairly, fairly simply to understand what's the size of the population, what percent of the population are being treated. So those are, that's the kind of math we, we do uh, when we, ass we assess the market. What percent of do we think is premium priced and what percent is lower priced? And you can do that kind of by looking at the hospitals. So a country like Brazil, for example, we can do a very easy assessment of how much, how much business goes through the private hospitals. 
where we know they can afford the premium products. And we can size that business and then figure out based on that, which products are going to be successful in Brazil. And, and then the lower price segment, we have to decide, can we make money there? Do we have the portfolio? Do we want to invest that portfolio? And that's, that's a harder process for us. The premium part isn't uh, that difficult to assess. Uh, the harder part then is figuring out which distributors are you going to use? Can you go direct to the hospitals? We love to go as direct as possible because every time you go through distribution, they take pieces of margin and then you have risks of corruption. Every time you have what we call indirect channels, there's risks of corruption. And so we try to minimize that as much as possible and have to go through a thorough vetting process. But the actual you know, economics to figure out whether you can be successful, the macro view is not that difficult. Uh, the harder part is figuring out the the sort of the bricks and mortar that you have to build <laughs> to make it a sustainable business and how to service the, the customer afterwards. Okay. And though, and you know, you mentioned that you had pulled out of a lot of markets too. I assume this, the same kind of analysis and, and that allows you, it sounded like you made, um, well, let me ask as a question. Is, it, was that something that you under, you recognized and sort of did all at once uh, or not all at once, but in a, fairly concentrated time period of pulling out of those markets. And so it wasn't like it was that you were on the, on the, um, on the edge on a number of them and just went one way or the other. It was a fundamental sort of change in the way you were viewing it. Is that correct? Yeah. Strategic reset is what I would call it. Okay. We, our, our leadership team sat together. We did the thorough analysis. We identified the 20 countries and we moved with speed and we did it okay. over kind of a two, three year period. Uh, fortunately, I never had to call it out on an earnings call. So, uh, because the rest of the business was doing so well, uh, I was prepared to though. If if the if the sales were drop was so significant, I was prepared to say part of the reason we missed our number or our sales were low was because we exited. But it, I was we were able to do it. The reason it took two three years is we had contracts in place. We had to wait till the contracts ended with distributors. We had to give them notifications. We also had certain customers that sort of were relying on things and asked us to stay for a certain period of time to, to be able to make the transition. So it was a little complicated, but it took a two-year, three-year period, but it was a reset, a strategic reset. And we did it all at once. And now as we enter countries, we're a lot more thoughtful. And partially, you know, when we buy a company, sometimes we buy a company, they happen to be in the country we just exited. That, that is not fun. <laughs> when you just finish exiting a country, then you buy a, a company, they have products in that country. And and the hospital says, well, are you going to stay or are you going to exit? So we now have a thorough process within our company about which countries we're in. Sometimes it's only for certain businesses. Um, it's not always the full portfolio, but we're much more disciplined as a company about choosing the countries. The problem in the past with Stryker, and I'm sure this is true with a lot of other companies, is if you have an international business, they just sort of had the autonomy and authority to just go wherever they wanted. And they would drive their sales up by pushing products to distributors. And if you don't have the, the mechanisms to make sure that that is going to be a sustainable long-term business and, and that there's good service and that the corruption index is not too high, that you're going to have a good long-term business, the short-termism is dangerous, that the incentives of the, these region, regional leaders can't be allowed to just go anywhere they want without approval. And so we've now put those guardrails in place. Great. A um, couple questions on COVID. Uh, can you share a bit more about how Stryker has had to adapt during the COVID-19 pandemic, whether in its general management and operations, its product line, supply chain management, et cetera? It's been a big challenge, just like it is for everybody. I would say uh, for manufacturing and for uh, most of our sales force, it's really hasn't, there's been no change. So half of our workforce kept going into work every day throughout the pandemic people who are making our medical products, which are life-saving in nature. So we were uh, an essential service. So we kept all of our factories open. We kept on making our products, which are used in hospitals every day. Our trauma salespeople, our joint replacement salespeople, uh, they were in the hospitals every day, uh, side by side with surgeons. Now, occasionally, if the patient had COVID, they would stand outside the room instead of being inside the room with the, with the doctors. But I'm very proud of our, the way our team stepped up and were on the front line with their customers. The other half are the ones that experienced real uh, change, right? R&D engineers, how do you in invent a product when you're not, you're not going to the office? <laughs> well, they had to create things in their garages. 
people were meeting in parks uh, <laughs> instead of meeting in the office. Uh, and so we, but what we, what came out of that actually was uh, some really good things. I mean, the technology like we're doing today, it's amazing, right? You can actually be very productive. We never would have guessed we could be this productive. Even training some of our products, we could do a lot of virtual training, uh, meeting virtually, having more global connections with our employees. We, be, we become more global. We become better connected than we were prior. And we become more flexible. Stryker was a very uh, work at the office company, five days a week, high touch, high travel. And what we've realized is we were way too rigid and we are now absolutely relaxing um, our approach. And we are not expecting people to go to work every day, even after the pandemic completely goes away. Let's hope it does, <laughs> or let's say it becomes just an endemic. Uh, we, we've told our employees, we don't expect you to go into the office five days a week. Uh, we do expect you to be there regularly and each team can decide. So we are not implementing a, uh, what I call a lazy approach of just saying, everyone has to come to work these three days. Right? three days a week. I think it's not a one size fits all. We're, we're mm -hmm. allowing for teams to be flexible and they're making their own choices. And frankly, it's being embraced. Our employee engagement scores actually went up this year, which I was shocked. I, I was expecting them to go down. And it's the company that does the survey for us told us that most companies went down. And I said, well, how did our, it didn't go up a lot, but let's just say it went up marginally, but it, it didn't go down. And I said, well, so what explains that? He said, I don't know. He said, there's something about your culture. And so I just think we, you know, we have employees just found a way to make things work and uh, realized relationships were important and just found alternate ways to do it. And I wish I knew exactly so I could tell you uh, very, with articulate words, but we were able to do it and, and I hope we can sustain it. And I think the fact that, you know, we, we decided to embrace this and not fight it uh, and not rush people back in the office, I think those are things that our employees really appreciated. Let me let me ask a follow-up question on that on the supply chains. Yes. Um, there was some discussion around uh, instead of having sourcing for, global sourcing from one location, having more regional sourcing or more regional supply chains. Have you and and I could imagine that could also affect some of your activity in low-middle income countries on the production side. Has any of that taken place at Stryker? Not yet. I would say the in the short term, I'm, I'm going to get to that. That that's a really important point you're raising, I want to get to in a second. I would say, look, in the short term, we, the challenges have been on anything to do with electronics and chips, where we're hand to mouth, basically. I'm calling CEOs of companies, pleading with them, because we don't need large quantities like the automakers. Uh, and our products are life-saving defibrillators. And, and, and so far, they've been great. So the CEOs, once they find out what the products are and how small the demand is, they're actually been, they've been helping us. So, but we're kind of hand to mouth on all kinds of electronics. The second part is we are developing second source supplies, which we never used to do before for some of our products, because we would have just, if anything goes wrong in a certain facility, we have trouble shipping out of a country. We, for some of our key products, we are developing a second source of supply. Now that tends to be today in existing facilities that we already have because of the regulatory challenges uh, it takes a long time to get a new site qualified. But longer term, I, we, to, to win in India, China, Russia, you're going to have to make products in those countries. You already know that there's a Make in India, huge initiative under Modi. There's a Made in China initiative under Xi. Russia's talking about the same thing. Nationalism is, it's high on everybody's agenda. <laughs> countries all over the world. And so we are planning and we already have two facilities in China that make products. Uh, we don't have any in India yet. We don't have any in Ru Russia yet. And I say the word yet because we will need that long term. There's no question. There's already preference being shown when they're buying products for local companies. It, it's China is not, uh, they're not hiding it. It's absolutely happening. It's happening also already in India. It will happen in Russia as well. And so we are building our plans to be able to either buy companies that are local, like we did with the Trossen deal, or build our own facilities. Uh, I would say it hasn't happened yet, but it will happen certainly in the next decade, without a doubt. Great, thank you. Um, another question comes in, what does Stryker do to ensure their managers are prepared to do business successfully in other cultures? Oh, we do a lot of cultural training and, uh, and we do, 
a lot of people have global jobs. Um, I've had the pleasure of, and fortune of working in four different countries. Most of our senior leaders have not. And, but I think once you give them additional responsibility for other geographies, then their, their brain kind of changes forever. And, uh, and we've been doing that over the past decade. Uh, we have a lot of uh, exchanges where we exchange employees. And, and so if, if I think about uh, a lot of our leaders in Europe have come from other countries, they go to Americans go to a stint, then they come back. Uh, and so we have to do more of that, but that's something that wasn't done too much when I first arrived at Stryker. And we have a lot more movement of people now than we did uh, historically. And, and that really does help to develop a global mindset uh, in the company. And, and I would say we're getting much more global. I mean, the fact that we're getting these awards globally is the only way you can do that is if you're having really, if they, those regions have to be well supported by their, by their division. And if their division, you know, don't under, if they don't understand the region, you're not going to, they're not going to be engaged. And so that's a good sign for me, but we have still a long way to go. Um, Sort of following on that, how much does your uh, do your business operations vary across different countries? Uh, and the question goes on to say, I, I imagine there's some things that work across all the countries, but there are aspects of the operations in a given country that are starkly different in another. For example, training, compensation structure, et cetera. Well, compensation structure for sure is wildly different <laughs> depending what part of the world you're in. Uh, and so our compensation does is very country specific. Uh, but I would say training and uh, a lot of the other aspects are actually quite similar in the developed world. So if I go to Australia, if I go to Europe, if I go to the US, Japan, obviously language, then there's some cultural differences, but it's largely quite similar. And I've watched, I've gone and watched surgery in all these different countries and met doctors and it, the business model is quite similar in those, in those markets. The, the, the biggest difference, frankly, is, is just is training. Training in terms of peer-to-peer -peer training, um, how, to, how, to, how to get the residents trained. Um, so it's, it's not the, the, the training on the use of the products after they've been established as a surgeon. It's bringing them up the learning curve. That is wildly different in every country. It's a very, very different approach. And we have to get involved early uh, with these uh, academic institutions, academic teaching hospitals, and they're, they're, they're more challenging to deal with. I would say that's probably the biggest differences in the training area. And then, of course, compensation, it just, it's more country specific, but that's not that difficult. Uh, the training part is really the biggest challenge, I would say. So let me build off that a little bit. Um, in the area of interactions with universities, both on the research and the training side, um, are there opportunities you see to work together? I mean, given that we are a university um, that that aren't fully realized right now or that you'd like to see more of but between the business community and, and universities? Well, I, I think, you know, innovative approaches to, edu to education and training. Um, schools are, right, hotbeds of, of innovation. I think figuring out how to make simple simulation, low cost, ways of training, those are, those are types of initiatives that certainly there could be partnering um, and, and finding new ways of doing things because that's not the business we're in. And to be honest, that's, that's an area in, me, in the medical world we're miles behind. If you look at, you know, if any of you have kids or some of you play video games yourself, you look at the technology in those video games, it's mind blowing, right? Mm -hmm. And we've, we're just miles behind, years and years behind. And part of it's the regulatory process, but part of it is we just haven't, there, there aren't companies, they haven't found a way to make money in the simulation and training game. And, and so that's an area where I think there could be work we could do together and, and, and try to figure out a way, to, because getting through that training barrier is huge uh, in emerging markets. And, and you're talking about that not only for your own staff, but also for the clinicians that are working with your product. Yeah, I would say it's more with the clinicians than it's with, our, it's with both, but, but it's, it's, it's equally important with the clinicians as it is with our own staff. Now we've started to find a way. Trossen has, has done some great digital training. They, they had to through COVID uh, that frankly, they were more inventive than our, our mature business. Because <laughs> so it can happen anywhere in the world, frankly. You can get innovation from anywhere. Right. It, right. it surprised me, it shocked me, frankly. Well, I mean, that, that could be one of the arguments for some of these countries. There's an example I know of in, in Uganda where there's a um, neurosurgical technique that was developed there in Uganda. 
Is that right? Uh, hydrocephalus patients that is now making its way back into the United States. So I think there, are, and, and it's because of the constraints of the low resource setting force you to be more creative in other ways. And in some cases that way is gonna work just as well and you can use it in, in your high income markets as well. Whoa, I'd like to know about that because we don't, I don't have a shunt. So I have a pretty big neurosurgical business but we, Stryker today does not treat hydrocephalus. So I would, if you, uh, offline, can you let me know? I will, I will be happy to, to talk to you about it. <laughs> because hydrocephalus is actually in our portfolio is something we've thought about shunts, but to be honest, they're quite barbaric. They're, they're not uh, really great for the patient. We're actually thinking about potentially doing something endovascular to treat hydrocephalus would be less invasive to the patient. And so we have some research projects on that, but if you have, uh, I'd be very excited to learn more about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to share it with you. <laughs> okay. So we're, we're getting close to the time and I wanted to sort of give you time to reflect more broadly than just Stryker um, from a somewhat higher view. Uh, how do you, uh, what do you anticipate will be the biggest difference in low and middle income countries relative to high income countries over the next five to 10 years in healthcare generally? And in particular, how much do you anticipate the innovations from these resource constrained environments will supplant tools and techniques in high income countries as opposed to the, uh, the opposite? So building on what we were just talking about. Look, I think that um, innovation, not just because of digital, just in general, uh, I think there's gonna be a, a huge spike in innovation in these lower priced countries. And, uh, but I don't think it's gonna come back here yet. So I think there's so much business in those markets on their own that I think you're going to see a big, big spike in innovation. Companies like ours, which were frankly ignored these markets forever, are not going to ignore them going forward. And there are a lot of great ideas that just die on the vine. They just, there are really good ideas, but they just don't get the airlift that they used to. I would tell you venture capital money is flowing into healthcare. And five years ago, it was not flowing into healthcare. There have been, I think, 12 IPOs in the past 14 months in healthcare. Uh, when I started as CEO, there were zero IPOs happening within the medical technology industry. So there are, there's a confluence of events that are creating, I would call a more vibrant ecosystem in medical technology than there has been in the last, certainly in the last 15 years. And, and that will spill over into these less, advanced, less developed countries. But I don't believe they need to bring these products back here. There's so much business to be made there. They'll probably be able to do that for five, six, seven years. And then eventually it'll come back here because bringing them products back is, is very challenging. Uh, getting them through the regulatory pathway. Get, you don't even need to do that. You can just sell them where they are. There's so much demand. Um, right, so but I'm if, excited. But if there is a big cost advantage, I, I mean, the, the demand would be even bigger in the um, high income markets, no? That's what it sounds like, but uh, it depends on the product. So why do I, they, China makes hips and knees. Uh, they don't sell any in the United States. None. Why Is not? Is it a quality issue? No, nope. the product, well, the products are not great, but they're okay. They're okay. Uh, the reason is that you have to get a sales force. You have to build instruments. You have to do, you have to, the, the, there's all these go-to-market barriers that are enormous. And so what I'd say is they're, they're going to serve their local market for a long time. They'll develop tools. They'll be, make better instruments. They'll be able to, and then they'll eventually come, but it's going to, so I, people were asking me 10 years ago, are you worried about China knees and hips manufacturing China coming to the United States? I'm not worried at all. And they looked at me like, what are you naive, right? You, you don't believe that. They're going to disrupt you and overnight it's going to, that doesn't happen in healthcare. It's not like an app. You can just click on your phone and right. I would never underestimate their technology. I would never undermine it. Just look at Alibaba and these kinds of, though you, you can't underestimate Tencent and these kinds of companies in tech because the barriers to entry are so low. In our business, strikers, and I'm not speaking for all of med tech or all of healthcare, um, as you've seen with generic drugs and they can, they can do very, very well. But in our space, it, there are huge barriers and it's not easy. It's gonna take time, uh, but they're starting to, I mean, cardiac stents, they're starting to arrive. So it's, it's not impossible, but it takes a long, long time. We see it coming from a mile away uh, and uh, we'll be prepared for it. But, uh, but I think the key is for Stryker is to figure out how do we win in these countries? And first in the premium segment, because we're underpenetrated, 
But then how do we, how do I launch a low price camera and make money at it? Because Trossen's proven to us that we can do it with implants. Well, implants are harder than the med search products. And I, I'd love to be able to build some businesses. We have projects going on right now. It's they're, they're actual innovation project we're funding. I have no idea if we're going to be successful, <laughs> but uh, the, the, pri the size of the prize is so big and the, the demand is so big that we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the, those markets and the patients that we could be reaching to make an effort and to try to, to, to make it work. And, and I'm hopeful, but I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm also realistic that uh, it's not easy. Uh, get, getting into new markets uh, with new kinds of business models and, and products isn't, is not easy, so. Kevin, thank you very much for your insights and your perspective. Uh, you've been very gracious with your time. really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. I, uh, I, I enjoyed being part of this and uh, you got me more excited about emerging markets. So thank you for that. Good, good. <laughs> and thank you to everyone for joining us. And on behalf of the William Davidson Institute, have a great night.